speaker is uh, Thierry Klein. Uh, Thierry uh, got his PhD from MIT. We're in the same group. Yeah, thanks to you. You signed off on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. It, was, uh, we were, we were, it was funny, because we were grad students together, and then I came back, and uh, I, I was on his thesis committee, which I always <laughs> felt a little funny, because I'm like, OK, I'm not sure I'm qualified. But no, that, no anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's not we, won't comment, we won't comment on that. <laughs> um, that's right. Thierry was, uh, uh, has been working at um, uh, Bell Labs at the Lucent. He is the chairman of Green Touch, the technical committee, uh, committee of Green Touch, which is a consortium, global consortium dedicated to improving energy efficiency networks. Uh, since last year, he's also um, he's a member of the Momentum for Change advisory panel for the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. Uh, 2010, uh, so he's won many awards, but maybe one of the most salient is in 2010, he was voted Technologies of the Year at the Total Telecom World Vendor Awards. Uh, so thank you, Thierry. Thank for you. Coming. Thanks, Maria. Um, all right, so um, I know for sure I have no epsilon in my, my slides. <laughs> I actually don't think I have a single equation in my slide, but I will mention an epsilon at some point. Um, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of a perspective of why we at, um, at Bell Labs, why we're interested in energy, why we think it's, a, it's one of the big challenges for the communication industry going forward. And then I'll give you a mix of some of the things we've, we have been doing, some of the things we are doing right now, and then there's a lot of, well, here's stuff that we think is interesting. And um, so it's as much a talk of, here's some interesting areas that we're thinking about, but I don't have actual results. So it's as much of a um, call for help and collaboration opportunities as, as, as anything. Um, so, uh, and so it's more of a high level on a lot of areas. Um, then um, that go way beyond my background because I, I discovered that a lot of things when you get into energy are on the hardware side and I'm absolutely not a hardware person. Um, so I give you a lot of touch points on what's going on and then if you have more questions we can always go, go deeper uh, in the Q&A or offline or, or later. Um, but I have to put a little plug in for Bell Labs because um, you know, this is, you know, that's what you get. But uh, there's also a good news. That, no, there's also a really good news um, behind it. Um, so just, I just have a couple of slides, but it's also leading into why we think of energy as a, as a big challenge as opposed to something that we've always kind of looked at in the past as opposed to it's the main focus for networks. Um, so Bell Labs, when you look at it historically, Bell Labs was created in 1925 or something like that, 1927, and Bell Labs historically has done very, very well when we looked at the great networking challenges. The Nobel Prizes that we have didn't come out by going after Nobel Prizes, but by looking at the fundamental communication problems of that particular decade. And then the Nobel Prizes really came out of it by m maybe being in that direction or kind of looking right and left. And the, the Nobel Prize for the, um, the back, for the Big Bang was not, they were definitely not looking for the Big Bang uh, and the, the cosmic background radiation. But it's sort of, when you look at fundamental problems and you look at fundamental challenges in communications, you discover very interesting things. And so we actually actually think uh, that we're maybe at the beginning of another great era for Bell Labs and you know it's been a little bit tough for the company for the last you know five years ten years or so but but things have definitely stabilized and and gotten better so this is our new mission statement we have um, Marcus Weldon has been the president of Bell Labs for the last 14 months or so and our mission is really to ch to um, to look at identify and solve the great challenges of the current communication era um, and, and really, we're going after what we call 10x game-changing ideas. So we definitely, we're in a, we're a for-profit company. We work with business units, but we're not doing the incremental work for the, for the business units. So we're trying to be directionally correct where we think the industry is going, but then we're taking two, three steps ahead of what the business unit is doing. So everything that we're trying to do in the labs is at least 10x better than state-of-the-art, you know, sort of. You know, it can be 9, it can be 11, but the point is not 10% or 20%. Um, and so this is a little bit um, how we operate right now. And this is where I think it might also be interesting for, for some of you in, in terms of explaining how we collaborate and how we collaborate maybe a little bit differently. So generally, Alcatel Lucent, we have our corporate uh, CTO organization, which is kind of driving where the industry is going, what are the big challenges, what is sort of where do we want to position the company. From there, we derive the research agenda. And we look at what we call 10x research problems. And those are your fundamental um, nuggets on research. You can think of them as individual pieces of research that we then try and put together into what we call future X projects, which are more system projects. And you should think of 10x research as being 
sort of we have a hundred of those and we have ten future X projects. You can also think of it the other way, saying what is the big challenge in the industry that defines a future X project and you decompose it to the key research nuggets that we have to um, have to work on. Okay, and then of course it transitions to to the business lines, IPR, uh, we get the funding coming back and so forth. But the business lines are very much aligned with this model. Um, in terms of them taking care of the short term, we take care of the long term uh, stuff. Um, what's now also interesting is we have these, these external inputs and we try and be much more open to how we collaborate with other people in the industry as well as with universities. And we had a couple of things there to mention. The Bell Labs Prize uh, that some of you may be aware of, some of you may even have submitted proposals, I don't know. Uh, but it's an annual prize we launched in 2014. Congratulations to Princeton for winning it this year. Um, no bias towards New Jersey, but we're very happy that the prize stayed in New Jersey. Um, uh, so Emmanuel Abe from Princeton won, um, won the Bell Labs Prize. It's, it's a pretty significant prize. Um, uh, 100,000 for first place. The, the winning university gets match. So this will happen again in the March, April timeframe will be the call. So keep an eye out for that. But that's for us also a way to understand what else is going on in, in academia, in industry that could be of interest and we're looking to collaborate then with projects that come out of that potentially. And then the research partners and that could be industry or could it be academia where we're trying to really have more of a strategic collaboration framework with, with universities. Um, and so the good news that I mentioned is like you have to sit through this kind of stuff, but also we do have um, a number of open slots for summer interns immediately in New Jersey. And this is the right time where we're making, you know, next month or so we're looking at who wants to join us for the summer and we have permanent positions. So you have to sit through these corporate slides, but also if you want to um, get your, summer, uh, your students into summer positions or permanent positions, by all means, let me know whether some of the things I'll be talking about is of, of interest to you. Let me know. I'd be happy to, uh, to, to follow up. Or if other things are interesting, let me know and I can direct your students to um, you know, appropriate avenues in the company. Um, okay, so what, when we're talking about these 10 X's, um, here's sort of the fundamental dimensions when you look at networks. It's, about ba it's always about bandwidth, it's all about latency, it's scalability, efficiency, whatever your resource is, whether it's energy or not, or other, other resources, consumability, costs, and so forth. So every researcher in the labs should be working on the 10x in one of these dimensions. Right? We do have some more business unit related projects that are maybe more short term, but basically every researcher, if you ask them what are you working on, they should be, ident be able to identify one dimension that they're working on and they're going sort of further out. And then we combine these into roughly 10, 12, we call future X projects, that really bring together a number of these aspects. And these are sort of what we think the big challenges for, for future. You see some of the stuff on what is future wireless, how do future communities work, what are, how do we interact with objects in the real world. So that's a little bit, you can think of that as IoT. Um, I'm particularly interested in something called Future Cube, which is really about, about the energy part. So you see sort of the main challenges of where we think you as a person, whether professional or consumer, what is important in your life, how you interact with your, your physical or digital world, and then from there we try and derive the, the research projects. Okay? So energy is one of those big challenges, and, and I'm going to, now we got through the Bell Labs overhead stuff, I get into why is energy, why is energy on this list? And then what do we do about it? Okay. And um, traditionally, we thought about networks as building networks for capacity, coverage, latency, and energy was always something that you looked at on the side. You know, you, nobody will say, I build a network and I want it to be really, really power hungry. Okay? Nobody did that. But nobody said, I want to build a network that's as energy efficient as it can be. It was always the nice to have thing. Okay? And that has changed. Um, you know, five years ago, it started to change. Six, seven years ago, it started to change. But it started to change for, I think, one of the wrong reasons, which was, you can call it greenwashing. People got interested. It's like, oh, we need to save the planet. We'll have to look at it from that perspective. And energy and communication and the internet is consuming too much. We need to, um, we need to reduce the consumption and save the world. OK, that's a valid reason, but there are a lot of other reasons. And the discussion around communication networks and energy has become much, much, much more mature in the last few years because we realize some of these other reasons to look at energy. Right? So I'll go through that. Um, 
Um, here is uh, a tool that we developed. Um, we call it GWAT. Uh, we're not very good at marketing, so it's something like global what-if scenarios on network consumption, and somehow we make GWAT out of it. But it's publicly available um, since April, and um, very proud that yesterday we just launched a second version of the tool. So you can just go on that. It's a pretty cool tool that tells you where the energy is consumed in the network and what happens if traffic changes in the network, what happens if you change technologies in the network and, and so forth. And it really gives you sort of this, this understanding of where do you place your bets and what are the opportunities for from research to change the energy consumption in the network. And before you get into the details of, oh, I play this, this scenario in wireless or this scenario in optical transmission, I change these components and so forth, there's some upfront slides in that tool. And one of the things that's interesting is when you look at roughly the communication industry and says it's networks and devices, and you look at the devices, overall, we estimate it that it's about um, 39 gigawatts of power in 2013, okay? Being in New Jersey, we say it's seven New York cities. I don't know what it would be, how many Miamis and so forth. Um, and then when you break it down, this does not include your TVs and, and so forth, which are usually considered part of ICT, but it considers everything on computers, printers, phones, tablets, and smartphones and so forth. The big chunk of the energy goes to your actual your PCs, your laptops, and so forth. Um, and phones and mobile phones, tablets, are much more energy efficient. Um, and consume much less. So this is, of course, a problem. You consume so one one gigawatt is about a nuclear power plant, right? So yeah. 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 I mean, it's global, right? It's not a U.S. view. This is the global view. Yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. No, 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 no. This is purely the devices. This is the phone, the laptops, the PCs, the printers, uh, and then the tablets. Right? It's no, no info. That's the next slide. Um, so, but there's a good trend here that we tend to replace laptops and PCs by phones and tablets. So while we think there will be a lot more devices in the future, we tend to replace power-hungry devices by less-hungry devices. Okay? So, so these, hmm? are, these are integral to the effect of the So is there not a lot more personal computers than phones and tablets? So, right. We're not yes. getting an idea that from our okay. So that doesn't mean that the phones and the tablets are much less. No, but it, that's, not, that's not apparent from this number, but it's true. Um, so, as you, if if this is, I don't know how many million personal computers, if you replace them by an equivalent number of tablets, this number would not move here. It would, it, this would go down, this would go up, but it would go up less than the other one goes down. Right? Um, so we tend to replace power hungry equipment by less hungry equipment, and so this is in some sense you can say on the device side it's manageable from a total energy consumption. The big problem on devices is battery life. And that's where what everybody worries about is, is the battery life. So it's the huge challenge is on the devices, but it's mostly on the battery life. It's not so much the total consumption. That's somewhat under control, and maybe the trends are favorable as we replace devices. Sorry, the total power consumption Um, yeah, I mean, no, I don't know about toasters, but so if you look at um, in terms of carbon, um, all of ICT that includes your home appliances, you know, your uh, your TV, not your toaster and your microwave. That's about two percent of global carbon emissions, and then you take half of it is data centers, and the rest is you know broken down roughly equal between the devices and the infrastructure. Right, so this is a sliver. This is a this is a sliver of that, yeah. Total, and that's just the total uh, ICT pie. That's the total. To the energy consumption. You said two percent. of global uh, on the carbon side. So and then of course you look at country by country. It depends what your energy mix is. Depends on. Uh, so it depends very much on the country. Um, but this is also why it's not why it's important from an environmental perspective. Because I said it's two percent of carbon emissions. That's. Is 2% big or small? It's definitely important, and everybody has to play that part. But it's not like you reduce the 2% to zero, all of a sudden, you know, climate change, nobody needs to talk about it. And this is why I think we got a little bit off track five, six years ago when I said, oh, the internet is consuming a lot, we need to do something, and everybody's bad. But then you look at it, it's, it's just 2%. 
And really, when you look at the communication, the infrastructure is like 0.5%. You go like, okay, put that to zero, and there's still a lot of other stuff. So I think right now it's a little bit of a more mature discussion. Energy is still a challenge, but f maybe for other reasons that are more important than just the environmental part. Okay. So now to your question, if you go to the infrastructure side of things, there. So that's everything between the home. Uh, so that's your your home box. That's not your device, but that's your your files box at home, all the way to the data centers and everything in between, okay, from your infrastructure. And maybe you will disagree with the data center side, I, uh, but I mean these are not just Bell Labs reference. If you go on the tool, you see some of the references. This is sort of everybody has their different number, whether the number is exactly right, but sort of the trend is industry accepted. And their estimate is actually much bigger. So between the devices and the network. It's two thirds on the network, one third on the devices, and um, this tool then shows you where the energy goes. And you see here between home enterprise networks, your your access now. This is all your wireless stuff and your fixed access. So that's your um, your cable networks, your your FiOS networks, so forth. Then you have everything that connects the um, the networks in between your metro edge, your optical backbones, and then your core and your data centers. And you see that most of the energy is actually on the two endpoints here from the data center side and then the access. And that's not surprising because wireless is just a very inefficient medium compared to optics. A lot of this is optical transmission which is just more efficient to transmit bits than wireless where you have a base station that just radiates 360 degrees and you're in one location and the energy is completely dissipated. Um, but here the trend is not favorable because we all want to do more. Right? We all want to have more applications. We all want to have higher bandwidth. We all want to have more services everywhere. So here we think the trend is not favorable because we'll be loading a lot more bits into this network and the energy is potentially going up. Right? And this is really the, um, then the motivation for a lot of stuff we do. Um, so then the question is, can we afford this future of communication where we all want to do more? So maybe question for, for all of you, who thinks they'll do less of Facebook, YouTube in the next five years? Okay. Who thinks they'll do less? Wow. Well, who wants it less? <laughs> well, that's amazing because usually there's one optimist in the crowd who says, I I'll do less Facebook, but you know, nobody, right? We all want more applications everywhere, you know, 4K, on the little phone, everything, right? And on top of that, we start to see this IoT machine to machine trend coming with 100 billion devices. So what is that going to do? Well, the way you handle this from a, from a pure capacity and, and uh, networking perspective, you tend to densify your networks. In wireless, people call that small cells. You have a lot more people that want to have higher bandwidth in the same geographical area. You, you put small cells in, you densify your network. Well, what does that do for you? Energy, you need more boxes and your energy consumption goes up. Right? So it's the energy consumption that will come from this traffic growth, but also the operational expense that come from it. Now you deploy a lot more equipment, you have to connect this equipment to the power grid. Um, so a lot of these challenges you can tie to this traffic growth, but are actually energy challenges as well. From If you want to deploy 50,000 small cells in the US, how do you power them? Well, you can power them by connecting them to the power grid. Great. Now you run 50,000 power lines. Okay. Now that will cost you. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so it's the cost of deployment, which is tied to, um, sometimes it's just the, the equipment itself, but it's also just connecting the equipment to, uh, to the rest of the network or connecting the equipment to your power source. And then of course we have a lot of scenarios off-grid, whether it's developing countries, rural areas, and that's not even talking about disasters where you know, we know from Sandy, we lost, um, we lost the communication capabilities because the power grid went down. And I think it was that order. It wasn't Verizon's network crashed or AT&T's network crashed. It crashed because it didn't have power anymore. Um, so a lot of these challenges we think are not sustainable for the networks themselves from, an, from a technical, uh, economic, and, um, and environmental perspective. And a lot of times we see that we're putting so much um, power into a very small footprint, you cannot even handle it. So you have huge overheads for cooling and, and so forth, just to, just to extract the heat out of the equipment because we cram so much into a small space. Okay, so what, what do we want to do in the labs? We kind of look at this and saying, well, if you want to have an aggressive goal, imagine you could, have, you could do everything you wanted to do, but it would cost you zero power. 
I liked your email last couple of days of the WTH. So this is my WTH uh, statement. But I didn't put it in just after I read your email. But um, it's really the holy grail of energy would be I can do anything I want, but it would cost me zero power. Right? Now at this point you should probably kick me out and saying he's, he's crazy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So I'll try and convince you why this is not that crazy and then what we can do about it. In fact, my, three zero, I have, my zero is three zeros. The first zero is zero grid power. So what if you could deploy all your infrastructure completely off grid based on purely on renewable energy sources? Okay? Certainly that would help with your, your rural deployments, that would help with your survivability of your networks, that would help your, your cost of deployment because you don't have to run power lines, you just have locally you harvest what you need. Right? So that, that would definitely be desirable, that is definitely achievable technically today. There's no problem, you can take any wireless base station, you put a big solar panel on it and you're completely off grid. The problem is it's not economically viable, it's not technical, it's not practical. So you look at how much the equipment consumes today, um, you have um, the, the physical footprint of a wireless base station, how much real estate you need to put the base station in versus the real estate you need for the solar panels, it's a factor 20 more. Right? So that's definitely not happening at large scale. When you look at, uh, at small cells, we do a really great, great job of making the small cell actually small, physically small, not just from its coverage area. And the small cell is you know, the size of um, you know, two shoe boxes. But the solar panel you need would be the size of the table. Now imagine deploying 50,000 of those, deploy that everywhere at Times Square, where you want this to be visually you know, unobstructive and on lampposts and so forth, but you have these huge solar panels, okay? So it... What's the base seat of? I'm sorry? How much power can the base seat have? Uh, a macro base station can be like 500 to a kilowatt. Small cells, 50 to 200. Depends on range, but that's sort of roughly. Yeah, my uh, my rule of thumb is 25 watts per square meter, roughly, and that's that's assuming I harvest for eight hours and I draw 25 watts for 24 hours. I, I'm not using the absolute limits on efficiencies, but sort of commercially available panels. So if it's 25 watts per square meter, roughly. Um, Okay, so, so this, is, this is possible today technically, but we just don't do it. And one of the reasons is we're not harvesting enough, we don't store efficiently enough, and we definitely consume too much for it to be practical. So this becomes an interesting technical challenge because I want to have the consumption go down, I want the harvesting to go up, and I want to have efficient ways of storing it and managing the whole thing. So I'm actually quite interested in the work you've done on the smart grid, and I was thinking, how is what you've done extendable when I take the load not to be an appliance at home, but it's a wireless equipment. Right? Um, the, second, uh, the second area is zero wasted power. We spend a lot of energy on cooling equipment. That's absolutely ridiculous. Right? I don't know if anybody works on, on thermal management here, no offense to you guys, but you should, uh, <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's, it's very, very, very important, but if you think that a router today, you spend half of your power cooling the thing, um, and it's not doing useful work. Okay? So that is definitely wasteful. You spend a lot of energy even when the, the equipment doesn't process any data. So typically at zero load you have 70% of peak power. Okay? That's very, very wasteful. So there's definitely more we can do there to have energy proportion to your load, have your overheads below, have your efficient AC-DC, DC-DC, your cooling, everything there is really, really important to manage the overheads because we spend energy on stuff that's not really doing anything for us. Okay? So I think, well, this zero grid power, that's an absolute zero. I'm not going to give you an epsilon on that. I think this zero is achievable in absolute terms. This zero on wasted power, this is where my epsilon comes in. I think we can, we, maybe we cannot get to an absolute zero, but it should be, it should be epsilon, it should not be you know, 70% of your peak power goes towards the overheads. Um, the third one we call zero energy per bit. That is really, um, if I know where I source my energy, maybe it's from the grid, maybe it's off grid. I reduced all the overheads. Now I want the jewel that I consume, I want that to do maximum work for me. Whether it's processing, transport, storage of information, that should do as much work as it can for me. So this zero is marketing. I will never get to zero energy per bit. But what we mean here is we want zero above fundamental limits. We want to get to the absolute minimum that I need to do the work that I want to do on that bit. 
Epsilon, yeah. Well, <laughs> the joke is somebody, and this is maybe classic Bell Lab, somebody was actually trying to figure out if there's some fundamental law where the answer is seven, because then I could say I'm working on 007 projects. Um, so, but so far we haven't found it. Um, okay, so, um, so that's kind of the holy grail, and everything we're trying to do fits in one or, or multiple of these buckets. And of course, there are dependencies on your wasted power versus your energy per bit and so forth. Um, where we've done most of the work in the last few years is really around the zero energy per bit or this, this improving the energy efficiency through work we've done on, on Green Touch. And I'll get to that in a second. I probably have to speed up. Um, what you have to do when you look at energy, you have to really look up and down the entire communication network. And um, although I'm not a hardware guy, I got to appreciate the hardware much more in the last few years because ultimately the energy is consumed in the hardware. And I like to say an algorithm or protocol doesn't consume any energy, it's really the hardware that runs it. So you have to fundamentally understand your hardware, your components, and you really want to build them at the individual device and component level as efficient as you can. Um, then from there you build your network elements, you build your base stations, your routers, your switches, and you build it up knowing you have these efficient components. Then you build your network architecture. How do you interconnect what is the best wireless network? If I have a thousand users in Times Square, do I want one big base station? Do I want a lot of small base stations? Well, how do I interconnect these things? Interestingly, this is, these are pictures from a study we've done on the German network where the, the only assumption was 50 cities and you have a 50 by 50 matrix on the traffic between the cities. What's the best way to connect them at the optical layer and at the IP layer? And we're also interested in seeing how the optimal topology changes as you change uh, for example, your underlying transmission rates or your, um, not the traffic matrix, but if I enable a new technology and saying I have 400G versus 100G optics, does that all of a sudden give me an inflection from a star topology to a full mesh topology? Interestingly enough, it, it, um, it seemed like the optimal was local stars and then fully meshed in between. Sort of you take your six, seven biggest cities, you do a full mesh between them, and then you do local stars. <coughs> and it didn't really depend a lot on I go to one T or I, I change my underlying transmission rate. So that was quite interesting because if you deploy a network today and you're saying, in, you know, in five years I'll roll out a new fundamental new un optical transmission rate, all of a sudden your network has to be completely changed. That would not necessarily be be interesting for the operators. Yeah. Um, okay. So now we have the components. We have the best architecture. And now, of course, we want to manage this because with traffic, it always changes during the day, it changes during the week, and it's never the same in any location. Uh, so you really, and this is getting to the zero wasted power. You want to be able to turn things on and off. You want to always have the, op the maximum operating point. Do you, uh, wh what is your sweet spot of your, op your amplifier in your wireless base station? Because you have different operating points based on optimal operating points based on your load. So you really have a very heavy component on management control, measurement, and a lot of control loops uh, here. But the point is that knowing that you will do this to manage your network you have to bake this in right in the, in the hardware. Because right now, we're, we can come up with all these great ideas for algorithms uh, to optimize the network, and it's, it's perfect. You can show these huge gains, and everybody is really excited. You go to the business unit saying, here, you should deploy, the, deploy this in the base station, and you can get X percent savings. That's great. But we don't have the hooks to extract information from the network, and we don't have the hook in the hardware to control it the way we want to control it. So if you know that you want to do this smart control, you have to really work with the hardware guys from the beginning and really have everything built in. And that's maybe the where I really appreciate the hardware much more that you know you do your, your optimization, your algorithms, but you really don't think about what does it actually take to deploy this and, and really implement it. Okay, and then we have the thermal management, and and there there's some really interesting stuff where um, we think of the maybe a data center. You cool it at the data center level, but now we get into some really cool stuff of with liquid cooling right down to the individual chips, like the liquid going right into the boards on the individual chips. So there's some some really interesting stuff where. You can go to passive cooling, where if you deploy a lot of infrastructure, it's just on towers, and you have free cooling at zero overhead. But also, you can spend some en some energy, a little bit of energy, instead of a big fan. You have your liquid cooling, and you pump your liquid. You spend a little bit of energy, but you get very high um, heat extractions. Okay. So I, I mentioned Green Touch uh, just real quick. Um, this is where back in 2010 we got very serious about 
the energy efficiency networks and we did some study to understand how efficient networks are today and how efficient they could be and there was a big gap so we said let's go after this big gap and um, come up with anything you need to do from an architecture, protocol, hardware perspective to improve energy efficiency by a factor 1,000. Okay, that's kind of a 10x is for babies in some sense. We did 1,000 with Green Touch, um, and um, so it's quite interesting because one, we gave it a very aggressive goal. We didn't say do 20% or do 2x. We gave it 1,000x, thinking that this is in the um, within the gap, but we didn't necessarily know how to do it. Number two is we said, okay, we give ourselves five years to do it. So uh, there's a, by 2015, we should come up with a portfolio of how to do this. And um, if you see me sweating, it's because now the uh, the calendar shows 2015, and and I'm in charge of the technical committee. So um, <laughs> I'm on the hook for delivering this portfolio. Um, no, the good news is we 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 think we can actually get there. Um, and we also think this is a new way for, for collaboration around this energy topic in the industry. And there's about 48 members right now from industry, um, academia, research institutes throughout the world, including some of our biggest competitors that we uh, managed to attract there. Um, okay, so um, why I'm confident we can actually get there. A year ago, well, now two years ago, we did a study on how far we could already get. And when you do a consortium like Green Touch, at the beginning it's, it's sort of a startup phase where you brainstorm on every idea is a good idea. And you spend a couple of years, you put all your ideas on the table and you kind of work on it. And at some point you have to decide what are your really good ideas that you will bring together and what are they actually doing. Because the one challenge here is we wanted this to be a thousand X on network energy. It's not enough to say, I have a component that's a thousand times more energy efficient. If that component contributes 0.1% to the network, you may not really be doing much. So it's really the end-to-end -end network energy efficiency. So you have to understand how all the pieces fit together, what their overall contribution is and what their relative contributions are. So um, we didn't want to get to May 2015 and have a nasty surprise. So we did an intermediate progress report to understand what could be done based on stuff that was happening within Green Touch. And the main headline is this bottom line here that we did some studies um, based on you know, a number of research projects and we already showed that you can handle traffic growth. So Green Touch takes a 10 year window between 2010 and 2020 for traffic growth. And we could show you can handle that traffic growth and still have a net decrease on energy consumption. So if you think back at one of my earlier slides, I said the concern was traffic is growing, we want to do a lot more and energy grows commensurate to the traffic growth. Now we're saying it should be possible, and this is from a research perspective, nobody's built this yet, but from a research perspective, we believe we can decouple these two trends have the traffic growth and have a net energy decrease okay? and the way you get to 90 percent this chart kind of shows in in wireless we've already shown two years ago that you can get more than a thousand fold improvement in energy efficiency and if you think that efficiency grows by factor 1000 traffic grows by factor 100 you get your net 10 per 10x and that's your 90 percent so that's roughly how you get it um, and, but it's also remarkable that in, in fixed access, so this would be all your, your home residential access networks, we think we can get some, something like 450, 500 fold. Uh, the gains there are of course less because they're already based on optical transmission, so you can't expect as much. And the core backbone networks, we think we can get to 100 fold improvement in energy efficiency. Again, lower gains, but those were expected. Uh, but the big, the big hitter will be the wireless side because that also has the biggest energy consumption from one of the earlier slides. The storage side, is, is it included in here or not? No, no, we go. It's more mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. No, we, um, well, <coughs> I think in, um, in this result, it's definitely not. In Green Touch, the data center itself is not included. The network between data centers is in scope, but the data center itself is not. Um, this result definitely doesn't include the data centers. What we'll include in the final result will probably be uh, an optimized placement of data centers, whether you not in the calculations will still not include the actual data center but will include the effect of optimized placement macro micro nano data centers the effect will be included because if if you optimize your placement of data centers it has an implication on your architect your network architecture um, so that's why i wanted to capture the effect of that on the network but not the data center itself <coughs> make sense 
Okay, so um, now I'm just going to go somewhat quick to um, to a few to a few projects that are ongoing or have been completed, and I chose these as a, as a subset of things we're doing because there's an important point that um, comes out when you work on energy that may not come across when you when you work on bandwidth or latency or cost only. Um, this is just a, a little um, uh, the latest result that we published back in November. Uh, where well we looked at fixed access networks only and uh, there are two projects that we announced. One is a new optical transceiver um, with optimized hardware, custom built ASICs, adaptive powering based on the quality of your, um, of your, of your line and uh, we can get some significant reductions on, on the energy of this transceiver. So when you look at this, you say, well, first of all, you have to optimize the hardware. So it's quite remarkable that just working on one piece of the hardware, you can get some pretty significant gains on the overall network. So we projected that you can get sort of 40, 46% reduction in the total energy consumption in your residential enterprise access networks by just changing this one component. So, so that's quite remarkable, but also points to you have to know where your energy is consumed and where your big opportunities are. The other thing, of course, is we're talking here 800 milliwatts down to 15 milliwatts, so how can that actually make a big difference? And this is why a lot of people stumble on the energy part because, well, I'm just replacing a light bulb. I'm not even replacing a light bulb here. So why does this even matter in the big scale? And it's because you have a lot of the scalability behind it. You have thousands of base stations. You have millions of these residential enterprise access lines. Okay. Um, so that's why it's important you have to take the global picture. Um, the other part is on virtualization. Um, and here we took the virtual, uh, the home gateway that's typically in your house, and we said let's remove all the, the, um, the energy intensive processing functions and move them to the cloud, right, and see what you can do. And again, at the per subscriber basis, it's pretty small, but when you multiply it by several hundred million subscribers, you get significantly large gains, even in terms of the actual energy that you reduce on a, on a world basis. And this is interesting because if you ask people the question, and maybe I'll ask you the question, is virtualization energy efficient? Okay, don't, I mean, I'm giving a hint here, but is virtualization as a method energy efficient? Or move to cloud infrastructure, is that energy efficient? Who says yes? <laughs> okay, who says yes? Right. Who says no? Who says it depends? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It actually it depends, and um, because generally people think I, I I have these functions that are running on dedicated processors, I move it and I can share the infrastructure. That's obviously energy efficient. But when you go to new architectures in the cloud, you go from a dedicated maybe dedicated ASIC custom built for a particular function. You go to x86 architectures that are not as energy efficient inherently. Now you go from very distributed things that are in your home. You don't have active cooling on your home gateway, but you put all of them into the data center. Maybe you need active cooling. So there are a lot of competing trends that where it's actually not obvious. And why this worked is is really because it depends on how many of these home gateways can you multiplex on a single platform. This worked because we could, and th they actually demonstrated, uh, I should say these are not just calculations, these are both two technology demonstrations. This home gateway project worked because they managed to get 100 virtual home gateways on a single server. If the answer had been they can only cram 10 on a single server, they couldn't, it wouldn't be energy efficient. So it really depends on what function you're doing, uh, how you're virtualizing it, and then you have to take care of the, um, the hardware is different. It's not just moving a function around. The hardware is different. Your transport costs might be different when you move, you have an overhead on your transport. Your cooling might be different. So it's, it really depends. And hmm? I was gonna ask, how about something like a cloud radio access network? Does that save you or? Uh, um, I'll have to look at that specific. I don't remember off the top of my head. I mean, mostly it helps you, but we we have specific examples where moving to a cloud infrastructure doesn't help you. Um, but for example, moving the uh, the packet gateway functionality in a in a wireless RAN to a cloud actually helps you. And those are scenarios I, I mentioned earlier. We we just released this version two of this tool. One of the big changes from version one to version two is we added the virtualization scenarios. And there's about eight different ones where you virtualize the CPU, you virtualize the the, the RAN, and and so forth. And I think the 
certain parts of the RAN you want to virtualize and you, you gain. You don't want to virtualize others mostly because of latency constraints. Um, but it really depends, and, and that's, that's a tricky part because um, even within Green Touch, there are so many people, you ask them the question, you go like, yeah, obviously it's energy efficient, we don't even need to talk about it, it's obvious. And it's actually not obvious. Um, the point though is not that I'm arguing against the virtualization or SDN or NFE or any of the buzzwords. Those things will happen, they have a lot of, a lot of advantages, but we have to look at the energy effect and be cognizant that we may pay an energy price for getting the other advantages. Or it opens up new research avenues saying, we want to do this in a virtual world, but we need to take care of how we do it in the most energy efficient way. Hmm? Yeah. This was. Um, in, in this virtual home gateway, there's actually no difference in the cost of transport because you're really processing your, uh, this includes some video processing, this includes your DNS, uh, NAT functionalities that don't actually, if you move the functionality to, the, uh, to a virtual environment, you're not increasing the, um, the amount of data you send to the home. But in other scenarios, if you go to virtual RAN, you will increase, uh, and, and that's why you have to take that into account. And maybe it could be that with current, hardware platforms with current transmission technology, it's not energy efficient, but when you look at the projections of where you will be in five years, maybe it is. And that's, that's some of the interesting trends we want to, to look at on, on sort of sensitivities around hardware evolutions and, and uh, transport evolutions. Okay, um, this one is, is also an interesting example. We call this uh, bit interleaved passive optical networks. Um, this, we demonstrated this a couple of years ago. Um, if you look, I'm not sure if you know how FIOS works, uh, if you have FIOS, but basically um, all the packets, it's a you know, multiplex system, packet-based system, everybody that has FIOS in the neighborhood gets all the information. And then you have electronics in your home that processes everything at a very high rate, say it's a 10 gig line. So the electronics in your home will process everything for everybody at 10 gig and then look at the packet header and saying, oh, this one packet is for me and it will drop everything else on the floor. And typically it drops like 90, 95% on the floor, but it did a lot of processing at the high rate. And that's, and energy goes with um, cubic power frequency of your electronics. So you spend a lot of energy unnecessarily for processing everybody, everybody else's packet. Um, this would, the analogy would be if you think about the postal service. I think it's not often that we say the postal service is efficient, but the postal service actually sorts the mail at the central location and only puts the envelopes in in your mailbox. The analogy of what FIOS would be doing in the post service would be the postal service is making copies of every letter, every package that comes, drops everything in everybody's mailbox, and you sort it and you throw most of the stuff out, okay? So what we've done here is, is sort of this sorting again. We actually go back in time to more of a TDM protocol where you know which slot the data will be for you. There's some overhead, some control loop that says your data will be in this slot. So all you need to do is you need to run um, a timing acquisition at the high frequency and then after that, you just zoom into the slots that where there's actually traffic for you. And you can run your electronics at much, much, much lower, uh, lower frequencies, and you save energy. And this is really um, a protocol change. <laughs> but what's interesting, and why I chose this project, is you make a protocol change. You go back in time. We, went on, we were on TDM. And sometimes you find when you look at energy, you go back into some protocols, some strategies we used in the past and we got away from. But here you make a very simple protocol change and it has huge implications on the hardware. This is you need to build the new hardware because you can run it at lower frequencies, but this is not a hardware project. This is a, an algorithm protocol project. And it's kind of interesting to see that dependency there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just to ask, if you take into account that the load is likely to vary, is how many problems yeah. you have or whatever? spending all your time listening to empty slots. Or, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, so if you download a big video, it doesn't change from a slot on a slot by slot basis. But yes, you uh, that the um, the schedule is in the in the header. So you took that into yes. Yeah. And so this is particularly interesting because of this dependency between algorithms and hardware and one can have a big impact on the other. Um, Okay, uh, here's one of our favorite topics uh, called Massive MIMO. Um, and this is something that in general at the labs we're pushing quite, quite aggressively as, as one of the 5G technologies where you try and really 
um, essentially line up your beams to where the user is. Uh, and I said, usually in wireless you have an antenna and everybody radiates 360 degrees, but you're in one very small spot. But here with Massive MIMO, you try and have the data come from to multiple users, the data comes from a large number of antennas, and it's coordinated so that it's constructively interfering at your location and destructively everywhere else. And for a long time, Massive MIMO, um, which Tom was at the labs, invented back in the mid-2005, 2006 timeframe, really was pushed for spectral efficiency. But we've also discovered that it has huge energy efficiency gains. And so some of the numbers we see are um, spectral efficiency, you can get a couple hundred. Um, total energy efficiency per, uh, could be up to a thousand in its own right. But what's important here and why I picked this is you have to look at total energy efficiency because that beam forming, that coordination requires pretty heavy processing. So it was pretty clear very early on that from a raw RF perspective, you gain on energy efficiency. But what was not clear is if you take into account that now you have, uh, say you have 100 or 200 or 500 antenna, you may have to, you have that many RF chains. So you have that many amplifiers, that many filters. Yes, each one can be smaller, but you still have that many. And you need the heavy, massive MIMO processing behind it. And a priori, you can ask the question, do the gains I get from the RF side, are they completely obliterated by the, the overhead and the, the energy from the processing? So that's something that I think when you look at throughput or you look at latency, you don't necessarily have to take some of those things into account. You, you worry about them when you look at cost. That's sort of the other metric I know where you really have to take an end-to-end -end picture. Energy is the other one. You cannot make trade-offs where saying, I'm really, really good on the RF side, and you, you pay huge penalty on your processing. So you have to really look at the end-to-end -end picture. That makes it, of course, very, very hard. And also, you need interdisciplinary teams because you need uh, an info comm theory person, you need a hardware expert, you need an RF expert, you need a DSP expert, and so forth. Um, but we, we believe right now that we can actually get these energy efficiency gains from a total energy perspective. Okay, this one is, um, is uh, my personal favorite, uh, partly because I, uh, I had the idea for it, but I'm biased. Um, <laughs> so this goes after the zero grid power, but not from the environmental perspective. Here we're saying, can we actually have complete wireless, wireless small cells? Because when we say wireless small cells, they're wireless from the device to the, to the network infrastructure, to the small cell, but you have two wires connected to it, the backhaul and the power wire. And when you look at cost of deployment, half of the cost is just running the two wires. And what you do is you, you want to minimize that cost. So what do you do? You end up placing these small cells in locations that are not optimal. We have a lot of people here, I would like to put a small cell right in the middle of the room, but I don't have a wire. I so I need to run a cable, I need to open the sidewalk, the streets, I do civil works. Those guys are unionized, that's going to cost me a lot. So what do I do? I can place it in another location where I have more access to power, but then I'm not getting good coverage. So I end up placing two or three. So I pay, so you get into all these, these bad, um, sort of these bad ways of addressing the fundamental problem that you don't want the wires in the first place. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, can we build small cells that really have no wires at all? And the backhaul, you can say, well, that's easy. I just use a wireless link. I use millimeter wave or something like that. Okay, but now you're thinking about the power. If you put a very heavy power intensive backhaul, you're just loading the, the amount of energy you need to bring to the site. So you need a power efficient backhaul as well. And then how do we get rid of the, the wire and the obvious answer is solar panels. But that goes back to what I said earlier, if I take a tiny small cell, now my solar panel is this big. So we're really trying to get, um, the fundamental goal of this is can I build a system where the energy consumption is so small that I don't even see the solar panel. The solar panel is no longer, no bigger than the actual box itself. Um, and that is mostly you have to work on the energy consumption side. You can do more work on the energy harvesting side and get your efficiencies up, but the, there's sort of a fundamental limit on solar cells at 68%. The research record right now is at 43% on the cells. So there's only, and the best commercial modules you can get are in the 20s, 20%. Those that go on satellites, military applications are in the 30%. So at best you have a factor two. I'm talking factor 10, 20 reduction in the size of the solar panel. So I really need to work on the energy consumption side. Um, and this is then becomes a question of, well, how do I do that? Um, 
And we're really taking, again, this end-to-end -end perspective, saying, well, obviously, we need to look at low-power hardware. I can take a small cell today and get the most energy-efficient component and just you know, not take the latest, the, the version that's in there now, but take the absolute latest research component from an amplifier processing perspective and so forth. That's not going to be good enough. You actually have to look at the network architecture and see where you place functionalities. And can you move functionalities around and really reduce as much as you can on the consumption, not just by playing on the components, but also on the architecture. You want to dynamically turn these things on and off because if the, the box is always on, but you're not using, there's no traffic in that area, small cells will actually be very, be very energy energy inefficient. We can show that they're efficient if you turn them off when you don't need them. If you leave them on all the time and you deploy 50,000 of them, you're killing yourself from an efficiency perspective. And then you need to have this integrated access technology to the device as, as well as backhaul technology. And I can't really tell you how we do it, because, um, but we have a way of doing it. And um, we can actually show this already. We have demonstrations right now that we show at our open days where we have a box that's pretty small, you know, about this size, with a solar panel that's maybe the size of the laptop, and it's sub 10 watts. So I uh, cannot really tell you how we do it, but we, it's actually running as a full end-to-end -end system. So that's quite exciting, um, but it's really a combination, again, of a lot of different things that come into play. Um, as well. But again, some of the work that you do, Vince, is on the, our controls are pretty rudimentary right now. So that's something that, you know, we can uh, look at doing more intelligent control between the harvesting and the, um, the, the, um, um, the storage and the, the usage of the, on the box. Um, okay. Um, this one I'll go uh, much quicker. I, um, I didn't think I had that many slides, but I guess I talked too much. Um, uh, the next few slides, I'll just give you the high-level view, and I'll, I'll skip through that. And I can make these slides available afterwards. Um, we think of future networks as really um, distributed compute platforms. And at a very high level, think of the only thing you want to do on information is storage, processing, and transport. And we think of, and whatever your function is, you know, a, a content distribution function may just be storing content and then redistributing it later. Some of the telco functions, you actually do processing on the traffic. Um, some applications, like um, uh, people think of multi-view video, uh, where you have different cameras in the stadium that collect raw information and then they're combined into your personal view. Um, so there's a lot of processing, but all of it, it it's, it's really just a function that you do on the content. And we think of content being generated in some places and consumed in other places with a certain popularity. And that's really the network of the future has to manage that. And we think of the network, a collection of nodes, basically they're big Lego boxes. And the red bricks are processing, the blue bricks are storage, and the green bricks are transport. And based on this content being generated, this content being consumed with different popularity distributions, changing popularity distributions, how do I place these functions? How many red, blue, and green blocks do I need in different locations? And where do I place them, and how do I dynamically turn them on and off? And out of this will come, is it a central data center, is it a nano data center? Do I have a large number of data centers or a small number of data centers? We're not really thinking of a subjective answer to that. Uh, maybe there are other reasons why we do it, but from a research resource consumption, where should I do these functions on the content? So we have, um, we have several, um, several projects in this when you customize it to certain uh, functions you perform. And what's quite interesting, we have, and I think we just submitted this to, um, to ICC, um, um, I think we have a couple of papers that, that hopefully get accepted there, um, on a generalized flow conservation where instead of just the flow representing content that or, or packets that flow through and your flow conservation is just the number of packets come in equals the number of packets go out, we generalize that model to include storage where it goes into a node at some point in time, comes out at another point in time, where you do fu uh, functional processing on the, on the packets. So the packets that go in are not the same packets that go out, but it's sort of a generalized flow conservation and then you can all apply all your machinery and you get sort of this, uh, you know, this optimal processing storage transport um, um, you know, answer for your network. But of course, it's, it's hard. So now it's 
what are some practical algorithms that get us close to the optimal and, and how do you customize so it's not this god box for doing everything but what happens if it's just a storage uh, problem, what if it's just a processing problem and so forth. Um, so, so that's sort of all stuff that's been, that we've done, completed or that's ongoing. Uh, one th a couple of things that are really exciting going forward is, well, in the future, um, we'll talk a lot more about Internet of Things, machine to machine, and it seems like something happened January 1st that now every day you get 20 emails on some announcement on IoT, and I'm not sure if January 1st was a trigger, but <laughs> every day there's like five emails on some IoT stuff. And so we're quite interested in understanding the energy implications of IoT. What happens if you deploy 100 billion devices that start sending stuff to the network? Right? Um, and again, we think of it in, in sort of, but we actually think of it a little bit broader than just these these smart meters or these uh, temperature sensors or, or, or cameras. Um, it's really, it's even, you know, ent Internet of Things is not even uh, fashionable anymore. It's like Internet of Everything. But we also think of broadening it to your actual physical objects, your physical devices. And we're not thinking of putting RFID tags on everything, but how do I interact with um, with the real world, with the, the real objects? I mean, what do I learn about the objects? How do I extract information? Yeah. Um, and it sort of fits in the, fr in the previous uh, framework. You need to power these devices, sure, but when you try and understand how you manage these devices, it's very much in the previous uh, framework, but now customized to Internet of Things, which has maybe very different traffic profiles, has very different numbers of, of applications and, and, and devices. So I tend to call it the sustainable future connected world. And that's, again, too big a title, but we really want to learn something, want to get knowledge about the world when everything is connected, not just people to people, but people to machine, people to objects um, that right now are not connected, that are part of your physical world. And really, it's all about the physical digital world becoming one, and you want to know something about that well, you want to extract information, and you want to influence that, that world, whether it's digital or, or physical. And there's a number of business challenges, there's a lot of diverse applications, interoperability questions, and, and so forth. There's a number of technical challenges, but when you look at the, the energy challenges, they're basically, I think, in three categories. Uh, I'll list several here, but you can, can put them basically in three categories. The first one is how do you actually just power these devices? Because if you want to deploy 100 billion uh, devices in the world, we're worried about powering 50,000 small cells. You're not going to run around, put uh, power lines to 100 billion devices. You don't want to drive around and change batteries. So these things for sure have to be very um, energy autonomous, locally harvested, but they're very small devices. They have to be very cheap. Now, low power and cheap generally goes with dumb. So they really don't have a lot of functionality because if they do, they consume a lot of power, they become more expensive. So we think of these devices to a large extent as being small, simple devices that have a basic function, they, they, they do that function, and then they connect to the network and all the intelligence is somewhere in the network, somewhere in the cloud, somewhere else. So you need to make sure you power these devices and how do you do that locally with whatever is available, whether it's you know wind, solar, vibration, RF, and so forth. Then what is your efficient way of connecting it? So most of these devices will be wireless uh, because if you don't want to run a power line, you don't want to run a, connect a communication line. So how do you connect these in an efficient way? And then there becomes the networking cloud problem on the other end. How do you handle the information that comes from these billions of devices? And so it fits with the, other fr the, the previous project, but now at a different scale with some additional wrinkles that for some of these devices, you can actually control their duty cycles and when they send information and what they send and so forth. Where if I go on YouTube, I download the video because I want to do it now. If it's a smart meter, I can maybe choose to have that information be sent at night versus during peak traffic time and so forth. Um, so there are quite a number of uh, interesting challenges that come, that come with that. Um, and we're just really getting into this area. And um, quite frankly, this is, um, probably a direction where we evolve Green Touch to understand where we'd be going uh, from an energy perspective in this, in this space because there's a lot on IoT but most of the energy stuff on IoT is really just how do I build low power sensors but we haven't really thought about the energy implications from a connectivity and then networking perspective so, so that's probably where we'll be going. Uh, this is just a summary slide. Um, you know, I'm just um, the <coughs> spokesperson for a bunch of people that do really great work, and I'm just a paper pusher. Um, 
uh, but there's uh, there's some really interesting things that we do, and I hope you um, you uh, you find some of it interesting, and I'd be happy to take questions or talk to you offline and send me email. Uh, we're always happy to collaborate with other people on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Terry. So I think I read somewhere that for a cell phone, the uh, half the lifetime energy consumption is in the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. you, you, didn't, you didn't say much about manufacturing. I wonder, I mean, a lot, yep. lot of energy, I mean, yep. it's, in the end, it's really, you know, the materials go in and the mm -hmm. energy. Yeah. What's the so uh, if you're if you're more in the IT space and maybe you put um, cell phones, smartphones in that that space, well, based on their the amount of th their lifetime, it's true. Most of the the total energy is in what we call the embedded energy from a manufacturing and, and uh, recycling and so forth. Uh, partly because their their lifespan is a year, two years, three years for servers. So if you look at IT equi uh, telco equipment, that tends to have longer uh, lifetime, say 10 years or so. There, about 70% of the, um, the total energy is in the operational phase. And that's why we, we tend to focus on the operational phase. We don't build devices. So it's true that in the devices, it's, it's sort of flipped. On the infrastructure side, it's still the big part is still the, the operational phase. Um, but if I put another plug in for AIU, it's not Bell Labs Research, but we actually go through a complete life cycle on all of the products. And, uh, you know, everything we do on network energy fits in a bigger corporate context on sustainability, which includes everything around responsible supply chain, conflict minerals, and, and all that stuff. And that's, that's very, very important for the supply chain to look at that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And you mentioned that in order to implement uh, the energy saving algorithm, uh, we need to talk to the hardware people. Now, that's sometimes very hard. Uh, <laughs> Is that a reflection on the hardware people or? Uh? Yeah. <laughs> what is the exchange? Uh, yeah. Both sides sometimes it's yeah. difficult for kind of to be put on a certain level and talk. Yeah. And uh, as I think about now, these people are kind of going to move in the direction also define something. So is that possible that is that the contractor will still have to manage through this kind of hardware? I didn't get the last part. Is it still possible to the software define? Yeah. Then you only kind of take the function yeah. in the hardware and show the operator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think software defined is, is the way to go. But again, that you need the hardware to allow you to do that. Um, ultimately, the business people will say, is a single software defined hardware platform cheaper than two or three dedicated hardware platforms? So that's, that's in a cost question. But you also have other, like, other, um, other advantage from flexibility footprint. You know, if you need to put three packet processors or, or three filters next to each other for uh, different bands, that's just going to make for a bigger, bigger footprint than one. So, so there's other advantages. But I, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in the software defined X. Uh, but it, it is hard, and, and that's why some of these things will not happen until you get to a natural uh, refresh, because you get into the next cycle where you, you can have the discussion on the hardware. And then, of course, ultimately it has to, you know, you can show the benefit, but ultimately it has to make sense from a business perspective. And I think what I didn't say at all here is, is really, uh, we can show the energy benefits, but a green base station cannot cost more than a brown base station, for sure. Otherwise, it will never fly. And, but I think there's ways that you can translate energy gains into real, um, you know, real business um, you know, advantages as well as you know, competitive differentiation. But, but I think you need these cross-discipline programs so that you have this right mix of people to have that, that discussion. Yes. Yeah, but I, I mean, we, I mentioned this project where we talk about um, the wireless, wireless small cell. We basically created a virtual team that brings people together that are networking aspect uh, experts, that are uh, digital designers, analog designers, RF designers, and, and they don't all report to me, but we created this virtual team and saying for this project, you guys, you know, 
you live or die by the success of this project. It doesn't matter that you designed a great hardware or you designed a great algorithm, but the whole thing doesn't work. So I think everybody has to buy into the big goal, and then you have to make sure you get the right people together. But I, think that, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, because it's hard when you do this in a company across different locations, time zones, cultures, and people who've never really had an incentive to work together. But I think that's what it takes. Okay, thank you.